Welcome everybody. I'm Aaron Keller. I'll be with you for the afternoon hours here along with Deborah Blum, one of our regular guests, as we wait for a trial to begin in the Jeffrey Willis case out of Michigan. This is in Muskegon and uh, Amy Dash was here this morning and this afternoon telling you about many of the details of this case. We expect it to start very, very soon. So uh, just look at the law enforcement work that had to go into this, Deborah. You've got uh, a 16 year old uh, abducted. OK. And then they start looking into who this may have been, and then the details lead them ultimately to these two other murders. Uh, one was uh, one victim who was killed in 2013, and then the Rebecca Bletch case that we're expecting to start any moment here in 2014. Uh, and they're all wound up together. How is the state going to separate this and try to get into this case uh, presumably up against objections from the defense that the defense doesn't want everything coming in against this defendant. Well, the case about Jessica Haranga is still open. So technically by law that shouldn't come into this case because he's not guilty of that crime. He's awaiting trial. So no one is supposed to touch that. With respect to the 16-year-old girl that was abducted, the judge has already made a ruling that that is going, that testimony is going to be allowed to give in, be given to the jurors. So the jurors are going to hear from the 16-year-old girl who was abducted, put in that van, and then she fortunately was able to escape. And from my understanding, she's able to identify the defendant, Willis, as the perpetrator of that crime. So that's going to come in. I just think with the other murder of Haranga, that's not going to. That would make sense. And, and of course, the question was going to be just how much would be stipulated to by the defense. Do you think the defense should have just stipulated to some of this or not? Because it just makes the client look worse to have that 16 year old testify. I, I don't know that they would stipulate to it. I think that, you know, to me, this girl was in a very horrible position. I, I don't know that she really would be able to identify the attacker. We don't know if sh she had some reason not to be able to see. Maybe he put a blindfold on. You know, maybe they have some information that hasn't been brought out yet that they are going to cross-examine her, but I agree with you. Sometimes it serves your client best if something is going to be damaging just to pull the Band-Aid and stipulate to it and have the jurors be told it, but they're not going to have to see it through the eyes of this 16-year-old girl. It would seem to me that that testimony would be very, very damaging unless, as you said, they're going to say, hey, look, you know, this could be mistaken identity. It could be a couple of other things, but that seems like a bit of a long shot for the defense to really try to attack someone like that's memory unless uh, and I don't know the uh, full picture of when this happened but I mean was it dark was the van not well lit was the defendant allegedly wearing something that made him hard to identify you know what else uh, could be there uh, to attack that witness's credibility as far as her ability to point to the defendant and say he's the one well, I think you hit it spot on. I think that it was the middle of the night, so that already leads to issues. It's dark. We're, there maybe were no lights on in the van. You know, they might know things that we're not aware of that they will be able to attack her credibility. And she is 16 years old. That is different than a 12 year old. So again, she's not a legal. She's not of legal age. However, a 16 year old is more articulate. Uh, I feel awful for this girl, but there must be a reason that they're going to cross-examine her and try to bring out that she's not able to properly identify Willis as the perpetrator of the crime. Well, that 911 call we just listened to, horrific. You've got passers-by, Good Samaritans, trying to render aid. Uh, they're getting increasingly shook up in the process. Um, trying to save this victim's life. Apparently, she was alive when they found her and slipped away at some point during that call. You know, sitting here as a person who's not a part of this trial, it really, to me, explains why jurors, even in the face of not having convincing evidence, convict someone. Because listening to that tape, I'm not sure if it's going to be published to the jury. It must have been if we're airing it here um, and playing Depends it. Depends on the state's open record rules. Some states declare that 911 calls are just mandatory open records, even if they don't come into court. But anyway. So, it, yeah, you, you, you just explained that well. You know, I don't know if the jury is going to hear this, but to sit here and listen to it, it's just so shocking that these this husband and wife 
find a woman shot in the head. They're trying to save her life. I can't even believe that she was alive. You hear how shaken up they are. You actually even hear the victim breathing funny, which is, it's just so moving. And I don't, you know, you want to do justice for this woman's husband, her child, her family. So I think that that really highlights the fact that it's difficult to be the defendant and be wrongfully accused because sometimes the jury is just going to hear this powerful testimony, 911 calls, other things that they want to say guilty just to really put an end to this in some way for the victim and victim's family. So I'm wondering exactly what evidence the state is going to have here because the bottom line is we, we know of two chunks of evidence, but we don't know all of what the state has. To the, prosecution, to the prosecution's credit, they've played some of it close to the vest. So a lot of it we're going to hear for the first time when testimony picks up, hopefully very shortly. But we know that they've used the bullets uh, to try to tie the bullets that were found, or the casings, I should say, near the scene where this woman was found by the side of the road to the gun that the defendant had. But we also know that that type of evidence can be attacked relatively uh, cleanly in court. And some juries uh, who we've observed here on Law News have just turned around and said, I don't believe that evidence, that you can match the marks up on the side of a bullet casing to a specific gun. And there have been treatises and publications on this topic of whether or not that type of forensic information is even reliable in the first place. It's back and forth, it seems. All right, what was the name of the football player who then ended up committing suicide and he was Aaron found? Aaron Hernandez. Case. Right, that happened in Aaron Hernandez where the prosecution tried to bring in a gun that wasn't necessarily linked to the crime. You know, there are often times that the prosecution will do that, that the judge will allow them to bring in a gun that's not truly linked to the commission of the crime. And I think that it can confuse jurors, but at the same time, it could open the jurors' minds up to the fact that there really isn't much here and that it's kind of just just given to them to try to link this person to the crime, but in reality, it does not link them to the crime. So I do think that jurors pay very careful attention, and oftentimes one forensic expert will say A, and the other forensic expert is going to say the complete opposite because some of these things are not scientifically proven and they're not beyond a reasonable doubt, in my opinion. So in the Hernandez case, we had two different guns. We had the state's key witness up there saying that the gun that was really used was tossed off on the side of the mass pike. And then you've got the state saying out of the other side of its mouth that the real gun was this gun that was found in the trunk of a car sometimes later and that the forensics match it up with a crime scene. So in that case, the state was trying to push one theory through its key witness and another theory through its uh, forensics expert. In this case, we don't have that. We just have this one gun matches up to uh, these shell casings. So might it be a little bit easier in this case for a jury to believe the link? Yes, absolutely. You know, I don't know how they link him to the gun. Did they find it on his person? Was it in his home? I'm curious about that. I think that there are ways to attack the gun belonging to him as his property if it wasn't found on his person. I don't know the nexus between the two. So I'm curious about that and I'm going to look more into this, but I do think that if they're able to really establish that it was his gun and the shell casing from one incident is the same as another shell casing from, I do think that they could really piece it together a lot more here and you know, apparently he had this box of horrors in his vehicle where a lot of this evidence was found and so a lot of it's going to kind of come out of that uh, some of that doesn't directly link him to this case so th the big piece here i think is this file on his computer that deals with the victim in this case now we know that there's a file we don't know all of what's in it and i think those details might be the critical details in this case and that the bullet uh, forensic information and some of the other stuff might spin around on the side but what's in that file is what i'm really curious right, about. right because i don't think that this is a case where we actually have direct evidence i don't think that you're going to find his dna on the victim. I don't think that the prosecution is going to try to introduce evidence such as that. So they do need to have some more circumstantial evidence such as these records that he maintained on his computer about this victim. That will definitely bolster their case. 
So we're covering a couple of cases here on Law News. We're waiting for the Willis case out of Muskegon, Michigan to pick up. They were supposed to start about 20 minutes ago. They have not yet started. As soon as that case